that's how we think about them. Yeah? Does anybody dramatically not agree with me? Okay, good. Yes? So, pose a doctor something that says, I get sick, but if I didn't get sick, can they start living a healthier life to change the probability? You're choosing a different gamble. So, so what I'm saying is the couple, no probability of the gamble, and then you want to say change the probability. You can change the probability. Absolutely. So, I'm sorry, remind me if you one more time. Andrew, that's okay. okay. So Andrew is saying, what if someone, the doctor tells you you have a 50% chance of getting sick or not getting sick, and then you decide to take an action that's going to change the probabilities. So you could imagine, right, so um, suppose the initial gamble is, is 0.5 times the utility of getting sick plus 0.5 times the utility of not getting sick, okay? You could choose a different gamble, right? And by the way, there's no cost of exercise or eating, right, because you're not doing that here. You could choose a different gamble. Let's call this G. Uh, well, okay, that's utility. G. And let's just imagine some other G prime where you pay a cost, which is you can maybe take some medications, you can start eating organic food, you can start exercising, right? So a bunch of disutility in some sense. Um, but you're going to potentially change these probabilities so that this one goes down, right? And this one goes up. But you could also imagine paying a cost for choosing another gamble in which you pay a bunch of costs that don't just change these probabilities, that actually change how bad it would be to get sick. Or perhaps even you like, you find you like organic food and exercise, and so you make it better to be not sick. So you can change all parts of this gamble. You can change the X's and the pies or P's. You could even conceivably, and we're not going to get into this at all, you could even imagine changing the shape of your utility function. If I start exercising every day, I'm going to wind up liking exercise more because of habit formation or because I make new friends, whatever. I'm going to change the shape of my little you. Okay, so all of that can be fit very comfortably into this framework. All right, so this is already psychology and economics in the sense that this is introducing psychological realism, not because psychologists proved it, but because we don't need psychologists to prove this. Simple introspection tells us that that is more psychologically realistic. So Bernoulli and then later von Neumann and Morgenstern import this into the standard model. Why is that not behavioral economics? I'm saying it's psychology and economics, yes according to what I said in the first lecture about the methodology of psychology and economics, which is to try to introduce more psychologically realistic assumptions into the standard model, why is this not what we typically refer to as behavioral economics? The reason why is because von Neumann and Morgenstern very cleverly figured out a simple set of additional assumptions that we can impose on people's preferences that make the expected utility model rational. Okay, I'm going to talk about that if we get to it at the end of this lecture, if not at the beginning on Thursday. They figured out a way to take a lot of the craziness out of the model by introducing a thing that they referred to, I believe, you can't bust me on this because it's not available online, but most people refer to it as the independence axiom, Kahneman and Tversky, for reasons that I don't know, refer to it as the substitution axiom. But Norman and Morgenstern, and this is part of what's incredibly brilliant about their work, is that they proved that if people's choices over different gambles satisfy this thing they call the independence axiom, then their, then their preferences will be rational and they'll satisfy this expected utility uh, model. And all of a sudden, it's not crazy anymore. It's still, it's still psychologically more realistic, but it's no longer an irrational departure from the standard model. And so it became part of the standard model. Okay, and we move on. Same thing happened when George Akerlof uh, discovered uh, the problem of asymmetric information. He made it rational, it became part of standard economics. Same thing happened when John Nash, sort of, and Fonnum and Morgenstern, by the way, in the same book, figured out game theory. They made it rational, it became standard economics. Okay, anomalies. We're going to do what we like to do here. This is our trick. This is our little, we're, we're a little one-trick show here. So we're going to do anomalies, and then we're going to do an alternative model. Okay. The first anomaly, so I'm going to show you two anomalies that have to do with the instantaneous utility function, and then I'm going to show you two that have to do with the probability weighting function. The first one is this, rejection of small stakes better than fair gambles. So a fair gamble is one that has an expected value of zero. We're talking about money gambles here. A fair gamble is one that has an expected value of zero. Okay? Um, so a better than fair gamble is just simply one that has an expected value uh, that's greater than zero. Um, Barbaris, Huang, and Thaler. We know who Thaler is. We've seen him before. Nick Barbaris is currently visiting the econ department for, this, for the month of September. A really fabulous guy. A lot of fun. Very friendly. You should go and talk to him if you can. Um, one of the nice things about Dick Thaler is that he has lots and lots and lots of money. <laughs> uh, both as an individual and as, a, as, a, as a, someone who pulls in big grants. Um, he's a mover and shaker. So he got, he got some massive uh, grants and they ran the following experiment where they went and they asked people, for real, real stakes, would you accept a 50-50 chance of winning $550 or losing $500? Right? So now, I say he had a lot of money. You'll see he didn't actually need a lot of money. Um, they asked MBA students, high future earning potential, financial analysts, high current earnings, and very rich investors with financial wealth averaging $10 million. Okay? They, they did this three different times with these three different groups of people who are all pretty high up on the income distribution. And most of them, including 71% of the multimillionaires, turned it down. Okay? 0.5 times uh, 500 plus 0.5 times negative, uh, sorry, times 550. What should I do? Negative 0.5 plus, no, screw it. What am I trying to do here? 0.5 times 550 plus 0.5 times negative 500 is 25 bucks. Okay? Even people with an average wealth of $10 million did not want to take a 50 50 chance on possibly winding up, with, I'm sorry, with a uh, gamble that has an expected value of 25 bucks. That might not seem that crazy to you. In fact, I would argue it isn't really that crazy, but it is wildly outside of the range of anything that expected utility theory can explain. Okay? So let me show you that. As you will hopefully remember from Econ 100A or 101A or the equivalent, the explanation that the standard model, the expected utility model, gives for why people turn down risks that they don't like, risk gambles that they don't like, is diminishing marginal utility of wealth. Okay? So we have this little u, how you feel about actual money outcomes, and we're going to map it out thusly. Okay? With, it's got a positive first derivative and it's got a negative second derivative. Diminishing, but the first derivative is your marginal utility, and the second derivative is whether that's increasing or decreasing. So negative second uh, derivative means it's convex down, which I call concave. How do I remember that? Because if you continue, it would look like the entrance to a cave. Um, so it's got diminishing marginal utility of wealth. The bump you get from the first little bit of wealth is much bigger than the bump you get from going, say, from here to here, right? Where it is, whoops, right? If you go from here to here, you get only a tiny little bump in wealth. Okay? 
And what does that do? Again, this is review, but I want to make sure this we're super, super clear on how that generates people not being willing to take these very uh, simple bets. Okay? So suppose you start out with some uh, current wealth W, which could be anywhere from zero to infinity. Uh, Saying it could be $10 million. The gamble basically puts you in a situation of contemplating whether you want to have a 50% chance of winding up with W plus 550 or 50% chance of winding up with W minus 500. The expected value, which is exactly in between those two points, is W plus 25. Okay? That's the expected value. You are currently here, a little bit below that W. Right? So there's this tiny little gap between your wealth and the expected value, but there's significantly greater gaps between the actual states of the world that you might find yourself in. Then, whoops, well, I guess I'm supposed to draw that in. Then there's this chord, this line segment. Okay? And this is the critical component of the model, and it's the thing that, at least in intermediate micro, people have the hardest time understanding. What we call this is the locus of expected utilities, EUs. What do I mean by that? If there's a 50-50 chance of the good outcome and the bad outcome, the expected value is exactly in between, right? Because you weight the two by 0.5. If I gave you the expected value for certain, your utility for that would be I'd go all the way up to here on your little u. But if I want to know your expected utility, then what I do is I say, well, what's the, expect what's, sorry, what's the little u of w minus 500? What's the little u of, sorry, the little u of w plus 550? And then I'm going to take a 50-50 weighted sum of those. That's going to be a point exactly in between those two, which is your big U for the gamble. Right? That's your expected utility for the gamble. It's that weighted average of your little U for the bad outcome and your little U for the good outcome. And it's going to be exactly halfway in between those two vertical points on the vertical axis. Okay? Which means that if I map the expected value to the expected utility, it's going to be exactly on the midpoint of a straight line segment between those two points. And I could change the probability of the outcome from 50-50 to 25, 75, 10, 90, 1, 99. And I would just find different points along that line. So you can vary the probabilities. And that line will always tell you what the expected utility of the gamble with that probability will be. That's why it's called the locus of expected utilities. OK, so what do we do with this? What this thing tells us, in the case of these gambles that Barbara Swang and Thaler gave people, okay, here's the expected utility of the gamble. Here's how they feel about saying no to the gamble and just staying with their current wealth level. Right? There's no uncertainty there. So we just read that off the little u. Okay? So that's little u of their current wealth level. And what this tells us, is that because of diminishing marginal utility wealth, because of the second derivative, the curvature, people actually, for a small stake, for a, for a relatively small expect, positive expected value, they would rather stick with their current wealth than take the gamble. Okay? Why? What's the psychological intuition here? What is this curviness doing for us? Okay, here is the difference in utility between sticking with your wealth and the, ups, the, the positive state of the world is here. I call that the upside. Okay? The difference in utility between sticking with your wealth and the bad state of the world is here, and I call that the downside. Okay? You feel the downside more strongly than you feel the upside. The downside matters more to you than the upside. Okay? It gives you, you get greater disutility from the downside than you get an increase in utility from the upside. That should sound a lot to you like loss aversion. It's not the same thing. Okay? Because this isn't about losses or gains relative to a reference point. Okay? This, is about, this is not a map of losses and gains. This is a map of absolute wealth levels. And it simply says that as your wealth goes up from any point, not just a reference point, but from any point, as your wealth goes up, you get your marginal utility that increases less than when it went up earlier. So it's not about going up versus going down. It's about going up a little versus going up more from any point. So it's fundamentally different. You should wrestle with how those things are conceptually and psychologically quite different. Does that mean that uh, if this study was done with uh, more lower income or lower expected income, that you would have a different experience? Well, we've already seen three different groups of people with presumably significantly different incomes. Even though, okay, so some of those ten guys with ten men or women with $10 million in current wealth have MBAs. So at some point in time, they were MBA students, which implies that some of those MBA students have an expected financial, future financial wealth of $10 million, but not all of them, right? Uh, uh, you won't actually find MBAs uh, spending lattes in Berkeley like you will with PhDs, but they're not all making, you know, they don't, they don't all. So we already have some evidence about the wealth, the wealth distribution. Um, I can tell you that from my perspective, way over here on the income distribution, right, very close to the zero axis, uh, the vertical axis, uh, I would turn down this bet. <laughs> so we have, we, have, we have two factoids. People with $10 million in wealth turn it down, and people with almost zero in wealth turn it down. Um, and, and that's where I'm going to go next. That's the real anomaly right there, is that, is that where you are in the wealth distribution doesn't seem to have any effect whatsoever. 71% of these multimillionaires turn it down. Any other questions about this? Yes? So, right, so that's analytically less rationally. Doesn't think about stuff this way. Yeah, no, I agree. Tell me your name. Todd? Yeah, you're, you're bouncing off of it, and I've forgotten. Well, but let me comment on that. I don't, I, I don't want to, you may be right, you may be wrong, but let me comment on what you're saying. What Todd is saying is that, hey, look, it's not just that these people have high income, but they're also like highly trained financial professionals. And so maybe they think differently. But wouldn't you think that a highly trained financial analyst would be more likely to think in terms of the actual investment value, the expected value, and less likely to get caught up in, oh, I don't like the risk? I mean, if you're a financial, if you're an investor or a financial analyst, you're in this world of trading these kinds of gambles all the time. I mean, this is just what stocks are. You want to take a gamble on stock or not? And we tend to assume that firms, say insurance firms or brokerages, those kinds of things, don't have any kind of risk aversion or, or whatever. They just care about the expected value because they're going to be doing this thing over and over and over again. If you're Warren Buffett, you're taking gambles like this all the time. The fact of the matter is we're all taking gambles like this. Every time you cross a street, you're taking a gamble at least this high stakes. Just last semester, I was walking across Hearst at LeConte right next to GSPP. Boom, minivan drove into a pedestrian. We're taking that risk all the time. These folks in this study are taking those risks explicitly with money all the time. 
So they're even more likely, they should, they're the ones who really should be thinking in a way that's more in line with the standard model. That's my claim. There was another question over here. Uh, let me come back to you. That was because the line segment tells me if I have a 50-50 chance of winding up with this much money or this much money, that means my expected value is here. But it also means I have a 50% chance of winding up with, can you see my little dots when I'm doing this? Oh, shoot, sorry. Um, let me switch to the uh, arrow. If I have a 50% chance of being here and 50% chance of being here, it means that I also, it also means I have a 50% chance of winding up with this much utility and a 50% chance of winding up with that much utility. So my expected utility is just exactly halfway between those two. So that line segment maps, oh, good God. That line segment maps from the expected value, which is 50-50 on this axis, to the expected utility, which is 50-50 on that axis. The curve maps from certain outcomes of money to your utility for those certain outcomes when there's no uncertainty. And yes. It's, sim it's certainly similar to what, we, what we've seen with loss aversion relative to a reference point. It's different because this doesn't, this doesn't require there to be any reference point. It looks like we're comparing the good side and the bad side to the expected value, but we can completely ignore the expected value and still see that as your wealth increases, how you feel about additional increments of wealth goes down, even when there's no uncertainty involved. And that's what's dry as a result of that, not because you care more implicitly about a gain relative to a reference point, but just because as you get wealthier, $10 means less to you then it turns out that when we introduce that into a model of uncertainty, you will care less about the upside than the downside. But it's not because you're comparing anything to a reference point. It has the same effect. <coughs> is it possible to show? So let's, let's figure out, the question is, couldn't you use this to show that people would take the gamble? Let's get people where they take the gamble. That means we need a point on the locus that, that they like better than their current wealth. So how they feel about their current wealth is here. right? So we need to find a point on the locus that's above that. Well, one way we can do that is we can make a positive state of the outcome much bigger, but the easier way is just to make it much more likely. Instead of making 50-50, make it 95-5, you know, 95% chance I'll give you. I mean, if I ask you right now, would you like a gamble? Here's an option. Stay where you are. I don't even need to know your current wealth. Or I will offer you a flip of a coin or a roll of a 20-sided die, where if the die comes up one, you give me 500 bucks. And if it comes up any other number, I'll give you 550. Would you be starting to think about maybe taking that? Well, I'm saying, like, with the same gamble, this model is No, no, no. I've drawn the curvature in a way to make sure they don't take it. I could make it less curvy, and then maybe I get to where they would take it. Yeah. That is the next graph. Thank you very much. OK. It turns out this cannot be the correct explanation, OK? Because for tiny changes in x, you're, you're final outcome in money, the utility function little u is almost perfectly linear. So here's the function again. And I had a person whose wealth was darn near to nothing, right? So that if I took away 500 bucks, they were way over here. And if I gave them 550, they were way over here. Now let's look at this people, 71% of whom turned down bad. They have $10 million. Let's get this thing into proportion, OK? The, the, the gamble that we're offering this person now looks like this, OK? There's a 50% chance that they might wind up right in there. Yeah? That is w plus 550. And there's a 50% chance they might wind up just a little bit below that at w uh, minus 500, OK? If you zoom in on that, it's a straight line in that range. Yeah? Did you like that? I thought that was pretty fancy. Stay up late doing that. Uh, and I have confirmed that that slope is the same as the slope right there. Um, it's just, you know, so what we're dealing with is, right, so I could say, okay, well, so there's 10 million is somewhere in there, and then there's a gain of 550 or a loss of 500. And when you zoom in on that curvature, locally, in, the, in a very, very small neighborhood, right, 550 is a small part of 10 million. Um, it's effectively a straight line. And it's just not conceivable that curve that explains how you feel about big risks, like should I invest this money in the stock market or not, you know, or even bigger risks, like should I vote for Rick Perry. Um, oh my god, I know, I know I'm not supposed to do that, I'm sorry, I couldn't help it. Uh, uh, which is going to affect a lot of people's wealth, by the way, um, positively and negatively. This curve that's supposed to explain how you feel about risks over really, really, really big numbers cannot possibly have enough curvature in it to explain how you feel in a tiny little range like this. Okay? And that's been demonstrated mathematically. Our hero, Matt Raven, back in 2000, right around the time that he was winning the John Bates Clark Medal, uh, pumping out, I don't know, somewhere between five or ten A-class publications a year, demonstrated this fact with specific examples of what utility, uh, expected utility predicts. Oh, I messed up my animations here as well. So this is from here to here is a quote from Matt Raven. Suppose, and this is on B-Space, suppose that from any initial wealth level, right, anywhere from being in an MBA in graduate school, living on student aid, up to having a wealth of $10 million, um, or, or below or above that, from any initial wealth level, imagine that a person turns down gambles where she loses 100 or gains 110, which is just a, you know, just a scaled down version of what we were looking at. Um, if that were the case, to have enough curvature in her utility function, her little u, to explain that through risk aversion in the expected utility model, then she would also, from any wealth level, turn down 50-50 bets of losing $1,000 or gaining